what was the inspiration for your, your still young man? I mean, of course, that became a big hit, but uh, did, did you or someone else actually uh, live that? Yeah, me. I was, uh, I was 18, and there was this uh, cocktail waitress at the After Hours Joint. We played an After Hours Joint in Fremont called Little Richards. And uh, the place would be packed because it was one of the two places in the Bay Area where you could dance between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. And she was a cocktail waitress there, really beautiful, looked like a, a like a little small Anne Margaret, you know. Somehow or other, she liked me, and we started having this romance. And she was six years older than me. She was 24 years old. And uh, she broke up with me and devastated me, and then we got back together. And it seemed like every time we went in and out, she was always telling me, you know, you're too young for me. You know, you're still a young man. You, you know, don't waste your time with me. Be with some girls your own age. And I was always like, no, 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 no. I want to be with you. You know, I was in love with her. You know? And so when, when Doc, you see, Doc came to me, my thing was always, I would take these sort of obscure soul tunes and I would mess with them. You know, I'd come up with a weird beat and I'd teach my brother how to play it. And then I'd make up a weird bass line to go with the beat. And I'd teach that to Rocco. And then I'd teach the guitar player something that would go in and out of what they were doing. So it was like a fabric. And Doc comes to me and he says, you know, what you're doing in these songs, it's amazing. He says, but why are we doing it to everybody else's songs? Why don't we write our own, you know? And I don't think I ever would have thought of that on my own. I mean, I was totally happy, you know? And, but I looked at him and I go, well, we can try that, you know? And we went to his house one night. We, he was in an apartment at the time. And, uh, you know, we're like, okay, what do we do? Well, first thing we want to do, we're listening to uh, an album by Curtis Mayfield and the Impressions. It's called This Is My Country. And there's a song called um, My Woman's Love. And it goes, it starts with a high trumpet. We loved it, man. I mean, it was glorious, you know. And uh, we had Mick Gillette, you know. The guy could play really high. So he said, we got to write a high trumpet intro, you know. So we wrote that, you know. And then we go, okay, so what do we do now? I go, well, song, we got to tell a story. I go, why don't we tell a story about an older woman telling a younger guy, you're too young for me, and he'll be, and he's, He's telling her, no, 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 I'm not, you know. And I came up with the hook. You're still a young man, baby. Ooh, don't waste your time. And then we started writing the story leading to that hook, you know. I'm down on my knees, heart in hand. I was accused of being too young. But I'm not so young. Can't you understand that I think like a man? You're still a young man. She comes in, she's singing that refrain. And then, you know, the next one is... Uh, Back once again, begging you please, darling, think twice about me, cause I'm not so bad. I can make you happy, I'm not a mad lad. And then the bridge, and you know, so we just started, you know, writing to that course and furthering the story. And that was the first song we ever wrote. Phenomenal, that's uh, quite a uh, start. <laughs> yeah. uh, I what? tell people now, I always say, it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> also, just interesting that your first one would be a little atypical being, you know, a ballad compared to what, you know, most of the stuff the group does. Well, right off the bat, we wrote to Knock Yourself Out. There you yes. go. Super funk too. So Bump City, the cover concept, where'd that come from? <laughs> we had this guy doing the, the covers. His name was Bruce Steinberg. Really good guy. And he, he had come up with some ideas, and we didn't like them. And uh, David Garibaldi had, had, had drawn this. It was a fist holding a chicken leg with a lightning bolt going through it. He drew it on a cocktail napkin. And uh, he goes, you know, we should do something like this, man. This speaks to our music, you know. And we we're like, yeah, that's cool. And we showed him. And then he came up with that cover with all this sort of blue, you know, it looked like he smudged it or something. We were like, Ooh, but you know, it was really late in the game. We needed to get the cover done. And that became the cover. But it was really, you know, I wish, you know, we, we would have used the cocktail napkin. <laughs> it was more impressive to me. <laughs> well, as you said, uh, the third record, self-titled, um, you were producing by then. And um, 
um, you know, what is hip then so smash to start that one off. Um, you know, after, uh, you're still a young man hit and you kept rolling. How did it change your life though? Were you surprised to have a hit of that magnitude or were you kind of expecting it? <laughs> Not expecting it. I remember I was telling this story when I do clinics, you know, I'm at home and, uh, I go to get the mail and I get this check for like $52, you know, and it says ASCAP, you know, and, uh, and I call my manager and I go, uh, you know, I think there's a mistake. I, I got a check. And he goes, who's it from? I go, ASCAP. He goes, no, that's your airplay royalties. I go, my what? He goes, airplay. He goes, you know, when your song gets played on the radio, I go, 52 bucks, really? He goes, yeah, I know that's sure. They go, so I can cash it. He goes, yeah, you know. And so then, uh, you know, a couple of months uh, go by and I get another one, you know, it's like $300, $400, you know, and I call him, I go, look, man, there, this, there's a mistake. They just sent me another one. It's like $400, you know, there's no, that's your, that's your airplay royalty, you know? And I was like, are you kidding me? And he goes, I go, so are these going to keep coming? And he goes, you know, as long as it gets played, you know, I mean, they have to pay you for your airplay. And I had no idea that was going to happen. You know, I, I tell kids when I do clinics, I say, it's the greatest profession you can get into. You spend an hour, you write a song, and then they just start sending you checks for the rest of your life. You know, it's amazing. So make sure you get your publishing. Yeah, well, we had it because, you know, Rubinson took our first publishing, but then he didn't do a good job administering it. And our manager went in there and said, we want to buy our publishing for $10,000. And if you don't give it to us, we're going to take you to court and show how you're even ripping your own self off. <laughs> and uh, we we bought the, the songs back, the six songs from East Bay Greece. We bought them back for 10 grand. And the next week we released Live in a Living Color. And most of those songs were on it. So we recouped everything. So we've had our own publishing ever since. Smart. Um, so this record not only had you producing for the first time, but also Lenny Williams kind of coming in to sing. Uh, how did he connect with the band? Well, Lenny Williams was, uh, it was interesting because he actually showed up when I was uh, 17 and we were playing this after hours place. Before it was Little Richards, it was called George's Palace. And we were like the regular after hours band every weekend. And we were looking for a lead singer to take to the Fillmore. And we thought we wanted a girl. So we were gonna to listen to this girl named Maxine and she showed up and she had you know a few people with her. And one of them was this guy, Lenny Williams. And uh, you know, we we're like, you know, Maxine, you know, why don't you come and sing with us and blah, blah, blah. And she didn't want the gig, you know, she didn't, she, she wasn't her cup of tea, but she, you, you should hear this guy sing. And we're like, yeah, no, we're not really into, we don't want a guy, we want a girl. You know, cause Cold Blood had a girl and Loading Zone had a girl. We thought we wanted a girl. And Lenny Williams, man, he just was like really good. He sounded like Freddie Hughes, who was a real popular soul star in Oakland at the time. And uh, and then flash forward a couple of years, and I was doing some recording at Larry Graham's house. Larry Graham had just left Sly Stone, and uh, you know he had some little recording set up at his house. And he says, "Can you guys come over and put some horns on?" You know, so we go over there. And man, this stuff sounded good, you know. And uh, Larry's there, but back then they used to wear these wigs, Sly did, you know, they were like afros with a little sort of wing in the back. So there's two guys there, Larry and this other guy with these wigs on. And, uh, and man, the music is so full, we're playing. And then we take a break and we go in the kitchen and one of the guys in the wig, not Larry, but the other guy comes up and he goes, uh, yeah, he goes, they call you Mimi, right? I go, yeah. He goes, yeah. He goes, you remember me? I go, no. He goes, Lenny Williams, man. I came out there with Maxine out to Fremont. I go, and he, all of a sudden he, he goes, he goes, yeah. He goes, now you remember me? <laughs> I go, oh, I go, and, and, and that was him singing on the record for Larry Graham, you know. And uh, I said, wow. I go, that's you singing? He goes, yeah. You know, man, you sound fabulous. He goes, yeah, he goes, me and Larry, we wrote these songs, and da-da-da. He goes, yeah, he goes, I remember you, man, when I came out. You, you got a good band. You, now look at what you're doing, you know. So we became friendly again. And what happened was Larry uh, and, and Lenny sort of fell out for a while because 
you know, all this time, Lenny's writing these songs with Larry, and he's thinking he's going to get half the credit, but in Larry's mind, he wrote the songs. So the two, Larry, uh, Larry Graham took Lenny's vocal off the tracks, his lead vocal. You can still hear him in the background. And that, all those songs became the first Graham Central Station record. And uh, then the, he brought in Chocolate, and you know, he redid it all. But you can still hear uh, Lenny Williams in the background on People and on Hair, all those songs on the Grand Central Station. Right? I'm going to listen to it thinking that. I haven't done Yeah, that's Lenny Williams in the background. But that was originally supposed to be his solo album. And then Larry started his, his solo band, Grand Central Station. And then Lenny and me, you know, we started, we were friendly. We lived near each other and we started writing. We wrote a couple songs together. And I really had his voice in my head because it was so unique and so soulful. And Rick Stevens is in the band, and that's when we started having troubles with him. He had drug problems. And, and you know, I, I had fired him a couple of times, and I had asked Lenny to join. And, you know, Lenny was friends with Rick, too, and he didn't want to come between us. And so, uh, you know, he never would join. But then I was in the studio doing the Tower Power record, and I had recorded the whole album. Actually, I had recorded six songs and then fired the guitar player and the sax player. Willie Fulton and Skip Mesquite for uh, drug use, you know, heroin. There was a lot of heroin in the Bay Area at the time. And we hired Lenny Pickett and Bruce Conti. And, and I finished all the tracks, and we still had Rick, you know. And Rick had heroin problems, too. Uh, and, and he kept on saying, I'm not going to sing until everything's on the record. He's out there playing whist, and he's loaded. And I go out there, I go, okay, man, I need you to come in and sing. He goes, I told you, I'm not singing until everything's on the record. And I said, it's done. Man. I only need the vocal. And so he comes in, and we're singing. And I had written So Very Hard to Go. When I wrote So Very Hard to Go, I had Lenny Williams' voice in my mind, you know. And, uh, and I'm trying to sing it to Rick. And Rick gets all angry. He goes, you sing it, you know. You're, you're telling everybody what to do anyway. And he stormed out. And I remember I called. You know, we had a lockout session at Wally Eiders. Suspensive, you know. I called the session off and everybody came up to my house in the Berkeley Hills. I said, we, we got to get rid of this guy, man. He's out there, you know? And I said, I'm going to call Lenny Williams again. And I'm going to tell him, you know, you better join this time because I'm, if you don't, I'm getting a different singer. And I called him up and Lenny said that he rolled over in bed and said to his wife, Pearl, I think he's serious this time. I'm going to do it. And so he came in and I knew that he would burn down so very hard to go because I wrote it with his voice in mind. And so I said, and he didn't know none of the other songs, you know, and we're due, the album is due, we're already past due. And so I said, uh, let's record So Very Hard To Go and mix it and we'll put it out as a single. And that'll buy us time to teach him the rest of the songs and also to teach him the live set, you know. And so we put out So Very Hard To Go and instantly, man, it just hit, it was huge. And then we taught him the rest of the songs on the record and, at the last minute, we brought in Chester Thompson, and he played a couple of things on the record and joined the band. And, uh, and that was it. We were off for the races. Wow. So, wow, a lot of drama just being three records in, but you navigated through it. Um, so you have a number of hits already by this point. I assume that you're starting to play bigger venues and probably going out and sharing bills with some other big acts. Yeah, I think uh, I remember one of the first uh, big concerts we did with Lenny as a singer was uh, Winterland, which was the next really big venue that Bill Graham had opened after Fillmore West. It was a bigger, it used to be like a skating rink or something. And he used to pack them in there. And we played a show, and Lenny Williams was his first big show with us. And we opened for Curtis Mayfield when he went solo. And of course, you know, we were big Curtis Mayfield and Impressions fans. So we learned one of those songs from that record that inspired us to write the Still Young Man. We learned uh, this one called You Want Somebody Else. And we practiced it all week, and we were going to debut it at that gig. And we really wanted to impress Curtis, you know. And he didn't even take notice of us or nothing. But, uh, you know, Lenny started, you know, performing with us from that point on, and, and the gigs got bigger. And as soon as we went so very hard to go in, we, we were really sore. And how much time, when you weren't touring, did the band spend rehearsing, writing, <clears> being <throat> together, making, you know, doing musical things? Yeah, it was a, a known 
you know, um, fact with all of us that if we were gigging on the weekends, you got back, you had one day. And then the next day, 11 o'clock at the rehearsal hall. We had our own rehearsal hall on Chaucer Avenue in Berkeley. We shared it with the loading zone. And every day from 11 to 5, we rehearsed. You know, and when we wrote at night, you know, a lot of drugging and partying going on. And usually we'd get high and be partying and they go, hey, you know, pick up our instruments and write some songs, you know. So it's like every day rehearse and uh, every night uh, write. So, you know, when you came to the four producing, I think it brought just overall a fuller sound, you know, more fleshed out. It just felt fuller. Uh, well, it, it started to sound more like the way I had always wanted it to sound. That was the difference. I mean, I knew how I wanted the band to sound. I knew what I wanted, you know, and I, and I was able to get it. So you guys kept rolling back to Oakland, uh, 94. Um, I thought that was a mellower record, though. It seemed like you kind of uh, went a little softer on that one for whatever reason. I don't know if it's just a mix of songs you had at the time. but Back to Oakland? Yeah. Mm, yeah, I mean, you could look at it that way, I suppose. You know, we uh, we had Below Us All the City Lights on there. We started to write these phenomenal ballads. I mean, even on the Tower of Power record, we had Will I Ever Find a Love? And, you know, uh, we, we brought in a full orchestra for Below Us All the City Lights on Back to Oakland. We did Town Motel with extra horns and violins. And, uh, but we also had Squib Cakes and, you know, Don't Change Horses and I Got the Chop. And there's plenty of funk in there, too. Yeah, you really remember it well. You know, I do a lot of these shows, and I usually have to remind the guests what songs were on what records, but you have it down. I'm, I'm impressed. I have a good memory. You know, even the guys they always tell me, you know, people come and they're asking questions. Go talk to Mimi. He's got the memory, you know. And then me and Doc, you know, like Doc, same thing. He always says, yeah, Emilio, man, he's got the memory. And then I'll be, we'll be talking, and I go, he'll say, remember we did something? And I go, uh, yeah, I remember that. And he goes, <laughs> between the two of us, we fill in the gaps. <laughs> well, yeah, that bel below us, all the city lights, I mean, that was definitely uh, something ambitious. And I was curious how you connected with Bud Shank, um, you know, certainly a known player. Yeah. When my brother was still the drummer, we had one of our first big gigs that we did for Bill Graham. We played at the Kabuki Theater in Japantown in San Francisco. And there was this band that opened for, for, for us. And uh, I remember, um, who's the famous drummer from the Wrecking Crew? Uh, you know, the guy that played on all the big records. Anyway, he was playing drums for them. And so we were watching really close. And then we went out after our set and there was this guy in a, um, like this navy blazer, you know, with the gold buttons and double-breasted, an older guy, you know. And he comes up to us, he goes, you know, I loved your band, you know. And he says, uh, where are you guys from? We start talking, and he goes, yeah, I'm a songwriter. And uh, those kids that open for you, that you know, those are my kids, I'm sort of sponsoring them. We're like, oh, you know. And Doc goes, you're a songwriter? And he says, uh, yeah, my name's Bob Hilliard. And Doc like goes, Bob Hilliard? You know, because you wrote with Burt Bacharach. You wrote, uh, you wrote um, Our Day Will Come and Any Day Now by Chuck Jackson and the lyrics to uh, Alice in Wonderland. And, you know, and I was like, what? You know, this guy's a really famous songwriter. And we became really friendly with that guy. And so when we would go to L.A., we would go in the Hollywood Hills to his house. And there was always something going on there. I mean, it was like, you know, there's a lot of stories from that, that scene, too. But... One of the guys we met, there was a girl in that band named um, Debbie, uh, what's her last name? But anyway, her father, oh, Debbie Betts. And her father was a guy named Harry Betts, who was a trombone player and horn arranger. And he was uh, the MD for Jack Jones. So if you listen to that song, Wives and Lovers, and you hear all those trombones, that was Harry Betts, and he had arranged it all. And so... We started hanging out and knowing these people. And of course, they knew all the number one people in LA, the number one session people, you know. And so, you know, when we're hanging out with Bob here, we, we, we would go to his house and we'd say, you know, uh, we want we want you, we want to play this song. And and he was like, okay, you know, he thought we were asking for help, you know. 
And so we played below us all the city lights and he goes, you know, what do you want me to do with that? And we're going, no, we just want you to hear it. He goes, oh, he goes, yeah, he goes, it's phenomenal. You know, we're like, well, we'd like to do it with an orchestra, you know, he goes, well, talk to Harry, you know. So Harry hooked us up with this guy named Frank Cap, who was used to be a session drummer. He had become a contractor and he got Bud Shank and Frank Rosalino and, uh, you know, um, Oh, what was the other guy? Vincent LaRosa on French horn and Edie Lehman was the contractor for the strings and she did backgrounds and uh, you know they, they just hooked us up with all the number one players. We had the finest string players and Bud Shank was right next to me, you know, uh, just phenomenal, you know, and we cut that track live in the studio. Wow. Was that ever used in a movie? It wasn't, but I sure would like it to be. It was an interesting thing, though. We recorded the track. We were real nitpickers. I mean, we would we would pick those records apart, you know, fix everything, you know. And uh, <laughs> we recorded the whole song, and it came out fabulous. But one role that David did was a little off, and he couldn't live with it. <laughs> and he says, you know, you got to let me fix it. We're like, you know. You can't. I mean, there's nothing you can do. And he goes, you know, what are we going to do? Bring in the whole orchestra again? He's going, well, yeah. And we did. <laughs> and we cut the whole thing again. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if we mentioned it. Before we move on, I just want viewers to uh, to know this was also the record with Don't Change Horses, which was a big hit off the record. So, mm -hmm. yeah. The Don't Change Horses was written by Lenny Williams and Johnny Guitar Watson. And Johnny Guitar Watson used to come up to our house in the Berkeley Hills, and he would sit at the piano. And he all, you know, his thing was always slow. We played things fast. Johnny was like, dum, 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 and really laid back, you know. And he wrote this song with Lenny called, uh, To Say the Least, You're the Most. And, you know, the way he did it, it was like, dum, 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 dum. Done, but we were like, John, don't, 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 <laughs> you know, we were on a recording that. But Johnny Guitar Watson was so for cat, and he would come on the hangout all the time. And uh, him and Lenny Williams were songwriting partners. And we, we had a lot of fun with him. Yeah, Watson was a character, right? But it, it, a lot of people don't know he was a, just a multi instrumentalist. Yeah, I, I saw an album after I knew him for a while. One day I was in this record store. And I see this album, Johnny Guitar Watson Trio, and I look, and he's playing piano like Nat King Cole. <laughs> it was phenomenal. Yeah, he was he was special. Um, so Urban Renewal, uh, you guys uh, were into the mid '70s now, almost uh, to the to, to the dawn of disco. But you guys uh, stayed the course, and um, you know, lots of. Um, like quick funky tracks on this record, you know. You Which know record I mean? are you talking about? Uh, Urban Renewal, my favorite record. Yeah, this one's like, yeah, I mean, it really hits you because you're short, concise, funky tracks, just boom, boom, boom. Yeah, you know, uh, that was one of the first times that David Garibaldi left the band. You know, he quit the band. We were in the middle of recording. We had recorded uh, "Willing to Learn" with him and got a good take on it. And then, you know, he couldn't take all the drug abuse. We were, we were all as crazy as could be, you know. And he just couldn't stand watching us kill ourselves. And he left the band. And, and I had been hanging out with this guy that used to play in the band Lenny Pickett played with before he came in the band. They were called Lynx. And it was this drummer named David Bartlett. And we had wrote that song, This Time It's Real, which was on the Tower of Power record. And we had written some other songs, and we were hanging out a lot. So I brought David Bartlett in. And we cut that record. David had a really good um, mind for songs and for recording, and just really good ideas. And he was funky as a dog. He was nowhere near as technically savvy as Garibaldi, and certainly not as great a drummer as Garibaldi, but he could lay down a pocket really good. And Rocco and him played really well together. And that record's still to this day my favorite. Did it come together, other than the things you mentioned, did it come together quickly? Or because I know you said that other one, you were like, you know, coming in late and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it came together. But by this time, I, I felt one of the reasons why it's my favorite is I thought my production values had sort of, you know, come into uh, 
maturity, you know, and uh, my ideas as far as background singing, as far as arrangements, as far as placement in the mix and mixing and what I was shooting for, everything about it. And all the guys were playing, you know, firing on all 10 cylinders. The songs were good. And uh, yeah, so we went through it pretty good. What if if I was in the band at that time with you in the studio, you know, what would I expect from you? Or if I was a fly on the wall back then, you know, how did those sessions go? How did you direct them? Um, what was the, the vibe like? Well, you know, I hear different things from different people. I've heard people say, man, I, you know, I was at one of your sessions, man, in the 70s at the record plant, and you were so laid back, and, you know, man, you just took it so slow, and you, and you were really, like, redoing everything and nitpicking everything, and, you know, but I was just completely passionate about the music, but I had serious drug problems, you know, and by, by the time we did Herbal Renewal, I had narcotics addiction and alcoholism, and, uh, but I was always real functional too, you know, like it wasn't as though I was passing out or nothing. I was working, I could do my work, you know, and I could create and do all that stuff. But, you know, it, it definitely was a hindrance in many ways, you know, but, um, passionate about the music, really passionate, you know. And the other thing too, people told me, I remember I had been at the record plant for about four years making records. And we had this big Christmas party. You know, there was girls there that I knew that worked there as, you know, assistants or, you know, receptionists. And, and we were all friends, you know. And I remember, you know, like we're sitting there, we're talking and they said, you know, for like two years, I thought you hated my guts. <laughs> and I go, why would you think that? And she said, uh, I don't know, you'd pass me in the hall and like the look on your face. And I go, I probably didn't even see you, man. My head was like in the bridge of the tune I was working on, you know. I was just really consumed by the music, you know. And it was, uh, it was a very creative time. And I had really excellent musicians around me and excellent people even in the studio. You know, uh, the lady that was the head of the studio at that time, she became my manager, uh, Michelle Zarin, later, uh, many years later, for 18 years, you know. So I developed a lot of big relationships. Like, when I really got severely addicted, one night I was in there and I was crying the blues uh, to uh, Chris Stone, who was the manager, I mean, the owner, rather, of the record plant. And all of a sudden he yelled at me. He never yelled at me. He loved me, you know. And he says, you know, you need to get out of those Berkeley Hills clouds and get in the business or get out. The business is in L.A. And uh, I was stunned, you know. You know, you come down there, I'll give you 24-hour access to the record plant in L.A. I will introduce you to everybody down there. You can get your career back on track. Quit whining, clean up your act, and get to Los Angeles. And I went to, uh, I had a big home in the Berkeley Hills, you know, and completely strung out, and I turned to my wife, and I said, we're moving to L.A. And she said, what? Why would we do that? You know, people in the Bay Area, they hate LA, you know. I know there's a rivalry. Yeah. Yeah, you know, why would we do that? And I said, because Chris Stone said so, we're moving. And uh, we had a brand new baby, you know, not even six months, and we drove down in a Volkswagen. I lost that house to my addiction. And we're down there, I'm living behind a pawn shop. But Chris Stone allowed me to hang out. The, the record plan was 24 hours. People are in there, you know, famous people in the recording all the time. You know, all the famous rock stars, Rod Stewart, Van Morrison, uh, you know, Eddie Money was in there, Luther Vandross, uh, Motley Crue. I mean, just all, all the big bands were recording there, and I was just hanging out. And everybody got to know me, and I would get sessions for the horns. And I started telling them, you guys need to get down here. I made them all move to L.A. You know, and I, just, I tried to stop using the needle and stop drinking and using all I really did was change seats in the Titanic, you know, but, you know, I sort of changed my drug of choice and, you know, tried to keep it clean so I could work in the session scene. And, you know, things got better. And, uh, what and then, year did you move to LA? I'm sorry? What year did you move to LA? 80, late 81, almost 82. And I got down there and, and then, you know, uh, we hooked up with Huey Lewis in the news and we started touring with them a bit. I did some of their recordings and they asked us to go on tour. And I made a deal with him. I said, you know, I got the band. I can't just 
you know, kept out of the band. And I said, but if you promise me you'll promote the band in every single opportunity that you can, and if you'll allow me to bring the band out to do midnight shows after your arena shows, and you guys come and sit in with us, I'll do it. And he was a man of his word. And, uh, you know, we'd play the bottom line after playing uh, Jones Beach. You know, he'd announced to uh, 18,000 people, Tower of Power is uh, playing tonight at the bottom line at midnight. And we're all going down to sit in. Why don't you come down and party? And the place would be besieged, you know. And so he sort of brought us back, you know, because we were in a low point then. And right at that same time, we started doing a lot of David Letterman appearances. We did 16 of them. We loved the horns, you know. And so things sort of started to get better. Yeah, yeah. So um, what, what were some of the first sessions with other acts that you guys actually did? I mean, you guys play with so many great stars, but. Yeah, the very first one was uh, a guy that sang for Big Brother and the Holding Company. His name was Nick Gravenitis. And Nick used to do a lot of uh, touring and uh, recording with Mike Bloomfield. And so Nick Gravenage was doing a solo album, and it's the middle of the night. We're, we're all we were always up late. The phone rings. We answered. Hey, it's Nick Gravenage. You know, we're like, "What's up?" And he says, uh, I'm, "I'm doing a record over here at Wally Hyder's, and I got this song called Funky Jim. And I think it would sound great with horns. Would you guys come over and put some horns on?" We're like, "Yeah, you know." So we all get in the car. We drive over there, you know, and then funky tune. You know, we made up some horn parts. About an hour later, we're walking out, and he goes, uh, man, it sounds great. Thanks so much. And he gives us a bunch of money. You know, we go, what's this for? You know, it's for recording. You know, we're like, really? Thanks. We, you know, we thought it was just, let's party, you know. And we walk out, and then about a month later, we get a call again in the middle of the night, and it's Carlos Santana, you know, and he says, uh, we're over here at CBS uh, recording, and we have this song called Everybody's Everything. And we think it would sound really cool with horns. Would you guys consider coming over? And we go, sure, you know. And we go over there, and once again, really easy, you know, da da da, da da da, you know, really easy to do. About what year was that, Emily? Uh, 71. Yeah, 71, I think. You can look it up, everybody's everything. Yep. But uh, it came out great, they loved it, and same thing again, you know, we're walking out. And he gives us a bunch of money, you know. We're, and we we say the same. What's this for? You know, it's for playing. Thanks a lot. And we're like, oh, we, we thought it was just you know come down and party. You know, we're all getting high and everything. We just thought we're partying. You know, nice gig. We to realize, oh, you know, wow, you know. And then we started getting calls because what happened was when we recorded everybody's everything, they were so excited about it that within one week it was on the radio. Literally, I mean, they mixed it like the next day. They pressed it and released it. And the next week, we heard it on the radio all the time. It was a huge hit, you know. And everybody's going, Santana, and who are those horns? You know, and Santana was like number one in the world right then. You know, he had just had Jingo and Black Magic Woman and Evil Ways. He was huge, you know. And everybody's going, Santana with horns, listen to this, you know. Who are those guys? And word got out, and then we just started getting calls from all these different people. You know? We wound up doing uh, the Caribou album with Elton John. That was several days recording. We recorded some, almost every Little Feet album, and we did their biggest one, Waiting for Columbus. You know, uh, several Huey Lewis and the News records. We did Pure Prairie Lead and Poison and P.I.L. You know, we've done. P. Diddy and Aerosmith and Neil Diamond. Most of the most of the time when you were doing these, uh, did did you have to come up with the arrangements, or you know how did that work? Yeah, we you know at first we were like I say we were doing head arrangements, but then later when when really uh, you know it was established that Greg was the horn arranger, we would just tell him, yeah, we'll, we'll do the date, you know, send us the track, and our guy will arrange it, and uh, we'll show up and play the parts. If anything you don't like, you want to change, we'll change it on the spot, you know. And we, we did that for years, and we still do. Wow. So back to, like, the mid-'70s, you know, there was a lot more competition or a lot more acts out there that were really emphasizing horns. Horns were, you know, one of the key elements of the whole funk movement. 
Um, so you had, you know, your Earth, Wind & Fires and your um, Brass Constructions and, you know, all these bands were also doing horns. So how did you guys look at that? Um, and how did that maybe influence you, if at all? Um, I don't know that I could say that it influenced us much. I mean, you know, uh, there might be something that somebody did that I liked. I mean, I'll steal from anybody, you know. <laughs> if I like something, I'll borrow it and I'll make it my own. You, know, you may never know that I got it from that, but I did, you know. But really, there wasn't a whole lot of those bands that I was like, oh, I want to do that, you know. Uh, a lot of them were really great and I admired them and enjoyed them, you know, but we knew what we wanted to sound like. We, you know, we write, we're different, you know, we, we write quirky songs and, and we approach the way we do our songs differently. Rhythmically, we don't come from the same place. All those bands were wood choppers. Do you know what a wood chopper is? A wood chopper, you know, like a drummer, you know, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh. You know, that's a wood chopper. When you hear that beat, you know, mm -mm, ka, mm, ka, mm. but we were always like, mm, ka, mm, ka, ka, mm, ka. you know, we always wanted to make it percolate and, and have these interesting bass lines and, you know, be off the one. Everybody's like, the one, man, the one. We're like, no, let's get away from the one. You know, let's do the 16th after one, the eighth after one. Let's hang it at the end of four, grab it at the 16th before two. And, you know, we just like to mess with the rhythm, you know, and I think that's what set us apart from all those bands, you know, we just approached it differently. And I think, you know, that really is the mark of a great artist. You have to find your own voice, your own signature, you know. And we realized that profoundly when the disco thing came in, because we had signed with CBS and they had given us a ton of money to sign with them. We didn't want to go with them. We wanted to stay with Warner's. And Warner's offered us a good deal. But CBS gave us a ton of money. They stole us away. And then they didn't know what to do with us. They looked at us as a problem. They didn't even want us, really. You know, and Yetnikoff gave us all that money because he wanted to upset Mo Austin and uh, you know, Joe Smith over at Warner's. They just hated each other. You know? And Ahmed Erdogan and Atlantic, they were always fighting between each other. And they would steal each other's acts. We were one of the acts that got stolen. We went to CBS and they looked at us like a problem. You know, you've already lost the battle when you look at it that way. You know. And uh, so we started, you know, uh, having problems and, and the record companies go, well, you know, it's time for a record, but we want to hear the songs and, uh, you know, we want to talk about producers and, uh, you know, they're trying to like tell us what to do. And we're, we're really used to that. We always made our records the way we wanted to. We did it in the time frame we wanted to do it in and we were in total control. And all of a sudden they're telling us, well, you know, maybe you could try doing a disco song, you know, a Motown tune disco style you know it worked for this band it worked for that band and then they're saying you know if you could try to sound like these other bands on the radio we could get you more airplay you know and so you know they give us a ton of money so we want to please them you know and we tried but we always sounded like tower of power you know and usually when we were doing what they suggested we sounded like tower of power only a bastardized version you know <laughs> and nobody was happy they weren't happy we weren't happy and then we lost all our contracts and nobody wanted us no more. They, they labeled us as dinosaurs and everything dried up. And when that happened, we still could play live because we had all these fans that dug the live show. And I told the guys, I go, you know what? Let's just, let's just do it the way you do it. You know, we've always just written our songs. Even whether we got a record deal or not, don't matter. We're going to write new songs and we're going to play them live and we're going to make sure these people dig it. And we just went back to being true to ourselves. And for a while, when we were trying to be somebody else, we thought we were cursed. You know, like, why can't we sound like the other bands? It's a curse, you know? But then after we went back to the mode of, let's just make the music the way we want it to be and stay true to ourselves, everything got better. And we realized it's not a curse that you sound different, it's a blessing, you know? And we never, wavered from that again ever you know and we stay true to that today yeah thank goodness for that i mean so many bands had to go through that kind of thing especially through the disco era but um that first record for uh, cbs uh, columbia ain't no stopping us now definitely was mellower more mainstream kind of pop here but i did think that um we came to play definitely brought back some more of the funk and uh 
you know, I appreciate that record much more than Ain't No Stopping Us or Ain't Nothing Stopping Us Now. Yeah, I mean, Ain't Nothing Stopping Us Now. I had Edward McGeehan vocals and, you know, and not to dishonor his memory or anything, but, you know, it's just, uh, I think we're still there, you know, and, uh, and I, I was deeply in my cups and, you know, in my addiction. And even though, you know, we made some great music and I'm proud of the record, uh, you know, the addiction thing was really affecting us. We had already, David had come back and we did Drop It in the Slob, which was a great record. Uh, but then, you know, he just couldn't take it again. He left the game, you know, so we had Ronnie Beck on drums. And Ronnie Beck, although he, he got it and he, he tried to funk it up and he did, it wasn't the same as Garibaldi. He was more of a wood chopper type drummer. And um, we just, uh, we, were, we were wandering, you know, and then we came to play, CBS insisted on a producer, so we threw Steve Copper's name in the hat and he came. And then at the time, he was having alcohol problems. And so the whole thing was just kind of, you know, really uh, wandering. And then we did Back on the Streets again for CBS. And I, I did the whole record in Chicago with this uh, producer named Richard Evans, who was another, you know, he was having problems in his life. And we did the record at CBS you know, said, well, we want to hear some other stuff. And we wound up going with this manager who brought in McKinley Jackson. We recorded, I think, three albums worth of material for them at that time and then put out one record. And that's kind of a bastardized version of Tower of Power. You know, uh, there's some good stuff on it, you know, but not not really classic Tower of Power. 